Hey, what's going on, everyone? Before we get into our conversation, I want to let you know this podcast is sponsored by BetRivers.com. BetRivers.com, the best place for all your sports gambling needs. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can also watch all of these episodes on the Field of 68 YouTube channel. Now, let's get into our conversation. Hey, what's going on, everyone? I'm your host, Eric Devendorf, and today we have on a legend, legend. You hear me? A legend, an OG, one of the first uh, to ever do it. He was actually, um, I think, Coach B's first big-time, big-time recruit, uh, and he's a great friend of mine. I appreciate him coming on. Roosevelt Bowie. Appreciate you coming on, Rosie. Hey, listen, it's my pleasure, Eric, at any time. So what's going on, man? How you been? Yeah, I've been fantastic, by the way. Congratulations on your win. Uh, I was there sweating with I was, I was there sweating bullets. But I knew you guys were going to pull it out. So congratulations for Bay Hives Army. That was fantastic. Gave me something to do this summer. Man, every, sing, every single game, was. Uh, it seemed like it was super intense. Oh, yeah, definitely. It definitely was. Yeah, I, man, I really enjoyed them. Doing a lot of fishing. A lot of fish. Hey, a lot of, I need to get, you know what? It's my fault too, Rosie. I've been meaning to get out there. I know you've asked me a couple of times to come out there. I I definitely have to do that. Well, I know you will. That's my, my new not-for-profit. I started uh, the Bowie Foundation and I'm, I'm teaching uh, underprivileged kids how to fish. Oh man, and that's big time. So I've been honing, I've been honing my skills. So I'm getting pretty good at it. I've been at it for a few years now. Nice. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to get out there. So so let's start uh, in Kendall, New York. All right. You're born, born in Kendall, New York. I mean, where did the where the game start with you? You know, who put the ball in your hand? Who you know, who put the interest in you? OK, so I was uh, actually I, I was in uh, Holly, New York, a small town near Kendall is where I uh, I lived there from uh, from the time I was uh, started school until I was 13 years old, and then the um, and I remember going by the gym one day and there was a guy in there shooting shooting basketball. I wasn't playing basketball yet. I actually started out as a wrestler, but I, I kind of I got tired of having my head into somebody's armpit, so I needed to look for a new sport. <laughs> um, so I went by the gym and there's a, there's a guy in there shooting shooting baskets, and uh, I looked in the gym. And I swear I heard, oh, and, I, and I, I was like, wow, that looks pretty cool. So the first chance I got, I went into the gym and I was in there for a half an hour and I made two shots. And, uh, but when they went in, I was like, this is, this is feeling good. And then later that, uh, then uh, later that summer, um, the house that we we're staying in, um, we were renting and the guy put it up for sale. We couldn't afford it at that time to move to Kendall. And I started playing basketball that next year. When I when I left Holly at age 13, I was 6'2. And by the time school started, I was almost 6'6. And when I walked through the door at Kendall High School, my cousins were already going to school there. My cousin was a uh, was a member of the varsity team. He's a big basketball player, and they took their basketball serious. And I just walked into a dynasty. And I had a cousin by the name of Nate that was uh 6'6. And you know those guys that they say they have, there's some people that jump as high as they can, and then there's some people that jump as high as they want to. Well, Nate was 6'6", and he had a 40-plus inch vertical, and he also played soccer, so he was the all-around athlete. So that was my competition, and we, uh, we, we found competition in anything. We used to walk down the hallways in the school in Kendall that had nine-foot ceiling. He'd walk down the ceiling in front of me and jump up and push the tile out, and I jump up behind him and put it back in with my head. That was you live in the country, that's the kind of exercise you had. Um, but everything was a competition for us, and uh, and and that's when we started playing. So at age 13, I was playing against the varsity players, and you know, they're trying to rough me up and get a little physical because at the time I was probably six, six, maybe I don't even think I was a buck sixty. And they were trying to rough me up a little bit, but I was all arms and legs and and angles. So every time they'd run into me out here, ah, oh, I was like, oh yeah. So <laughs> I just put, every time they got, they got next to me, they hit an arm, a wrist, a leg. They said, it's like getting hit by a two by four. And I was like, oh yeah. And that's when I learned my cousin, my cousin Aaron taught me. He said, 
no matter how much you weigh, if you weigh, you get hit, it hurts. But if you step up and you, and you lay a lick, it doesn't hurt. And that's where it all started. I'm a firm believer in when I set a pick, I just try to come back at least with one of your numbers. If I don't have one of your numbers, I'm disappointed. So, so you're 13 years old, you're six, six. Is that, is that really when you, I guess, found out like, all right, this is, I think this is what I'm going to do. Play basketball. Well, so I changed schools and I, so I, I left Holland. I came to Kendall at, a, at, a, at, in, at age 13, but at, the, at, the, at Kendall at the time, there were, I had probably 14 cousins that were going to school at Kendall. So I kind of walked into like a family dynasty here wow. and then they all ate, slept, and drank basketball. I mean, and at age 13, everything was a competition, whether it be running, jumping, whatever we did, we were competing. So, and it was at that point, I was already a good student. My grandmother, it was so funny, my first day of school, I walked in, I came into school, and my cousins came up to me, and they're like, hey, what's happening? How you doing? I said, I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you? And they're like, what? <laughs> Why do you talk so funny? And I said, listen, let me tell you something. My grandmother said there will be no slang spoken in our house and grandma rules. So I said, you can tell me I talk funny all you want, but as long as she's making my dinner plate, that's the way I'm talking. Man, that's 100%. That's 100%. When, when did the, I guess, recruitment start? Like, when did the letters start coming in from different schools? Okay, so by so I. So 13, I, I struggled through and I was, you know, I was, I wasn't that really that coordinated, but we all played together. And the one thing that my cousin that we, we learned is that you give hundred percent of what you got. So from age 13 to probably to age 16. So they probably started at age 16. So when I, at age 16, I ended up, uh, I was 19 points and 16 boards a game. And that's when I started really getting some, some notice. And I was, uh, I was six, nine still, I was maybe, I, don't, I, I may have been 169 pounds, maybe. That's with my that's with my varsity jacket on and in my jeans, work boots, and rocks in my pocket. And I was maybe 169 pounds. And I'll never forget that I was pretty excited about it. And I went to a, and I I think I don't know if it was at a Syracuse basketball camp, but I was going around and somebody had asked me, and and I ended up meeting um, Howie Garfinkel. You know, Mr. Mr. Five Star. That's yeah. where Michael, all those guys went to school. And I met and I met um, Mr. Garfinkel. He came out and he had on a plaid shirt. He had on some plaid shirt and green jeans and like some some blue sneakers. They're, they're all kind of colors mixed up. And I said, "This is Mr. Basketball." So he walks over to me and he looks at me, and he says, uh, "Yeah, he said, you know, you did pretty good. So I'm 16 points. I mean, uh, 19 points, 16 rebounds a game. I was feeling like, okay, I'm starting to figure things out. And he looked at me and said, you know, you'll never be a major college basketball player. And I, and I, I remember thinking, and I, and I looked at him and, and my good upbringing, my good upbringing came through and I, and I looked at him and I said, sir, be quite honest with you, whether I become a major basketball player, College basketball player or not doesn't depend on what you think of me. It depends on what I think of myself. And I and I remember turning and walking away, and I said, you know what? That could have been a moment that either broke me or, or a moment that that uh, that made me want to just you know crack down and start you know and, and be serious about it. And and at that point, uh, my mother used to say, my I, my I was so hard headed, my head was harder than Japanese zoology, and. I, <laughs> my head that, that I wasn't going to stay and that's when I started and that's when I just started anything and everything that I did I used to live my house is uh 13 miles from Kendall so it's a it's a country school and my and I remember asking my mom if I could play basketball now I had never been away from home to do anything other than the Syracuse basketball camp uh th I mean after be, the next thing that I did after playing basketball when I was 14, I asked mom if I could play basketball. She said, she had two questions for me. She said, how are we going to get there? And how are we going to get back? <laughs> she, asked me, she said, do you have a way to get there and a way to get back? And I looked right at her and I said, yes. And my way to get there was I take the school bus and my way to get back home was I walk. So, <laughs> and I was, so I was 11 miles from the school 
And uh, I could have got a ride home, but there was only one player on my team. There was only one player on the varsity team that lived out where I lived. And we were so intent about talking about the moves that we made in basketball, I always missed them. So I ended up having to walk home. I, so I, I finished practice at, at 10 to 7, and I get home at 1030. But the good news was I had two of my buddies that were on the team that we walked pretty much most of the way there. So, and, uh, and my mother, as long as I was getting home and getting back and, and, and my schoolwork was up, she had no problem. And uh, my mom at, see what, my mom kind of ran the show. His mom, she's about 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 what about buck fifteen, about five four, and uh, you know. So when she asked you a question, you answered. When she uh, when she when she said something to you, you paid attention because she had no she had no no problem doing something that would get your attention, like tap you upside the head a little once or twice. <laughs> and I made it a point. I didn't really appreciate that kind of stuff. So I, I, I kind of paid attention a lot. So I was kind of like a good boy growing up. I, I uh, All the good stuff I learned from my mom and dad and my grandmother, everything else I learned when I was at college. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet Rivers Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up with Bet Rivers yet, now's the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their new Rush Pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, more secure, and more reliable. With basketball season right around the corner, there's never been a better time to get in on the action by going to betrivers.com. Today or downloading the Bet Rivers iOS app. Must be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call telephone number one eight hundred Gambler. So when when I mean when did the Syracuse come into play? I mean, who was recruiting you? Well, uh, Coach Beheim was uh, was was recruiting me because um, Coach Roy Danforth was the head coach, and it was yeah. kind of funny because it, it, the, the funny thing about it was I. I, I, so I started, so at 16, 17, I started going to Syracuse basketball camp. I, I went up there, went up there with my cousin. I went up there, I met, you know, other, other players from around the area, did this camp. Coach Beheim was the assistant coach, so he ran the camp. So I got to meet him, got to talk to him, and it was very easy to understand that he knew, he knew a lot about basketball. You know, the, the thing that I knew about basketball when I, by the time I got there at 16 was, so my, my cousin was, he played center and he went to Roberts Weston College, never lost a jump ball at 6'4". He could, he could put a quarter on the top of the backboard. I mean, just freakishly athletic. And, and I said, you know what? In my mind, I said, if, if I can work as hard as he does, I, sh I should be a better player because I'm, I'm taller. And that was my whole, my, my whole mindset for my basketball career. No matter what my cousin did or what I did, I always had to work harder. He was he was a big he was a big fan of uh, Eric. When I tell you the hardest ever got hit in my life, uh, my cousin and I, my cousin Nate and I tried to double team him on the low post, and he was he, a six four guy that can touch the top of the backboard. He was a powerhouse. He wasn't yeah. any more than eighty five pounds, hundred ninety pounds. And we we went over, we closed out, put our hands up, had him boxed in. And he, he bent down and he drove his shoulder right into my chest, which was, which was about that thick. And, and he hit me so hard. And after, and after it hit me, the old cartoons, when you see they used to shoot a cannonball and it would go right through the person and you could look right through and you could see daylight through the person. Yeah. Well, that, he hit me so hard and it knocked the wind out of me, but I was so mad. I didn't want him to know he knocked the wind out of me. So I just stood there and I was going, and he and after he hit me, turned around, looked right in my face. And I was like, you know, didn't hurt. So second play, we do the double team, and he comes down. Same thing, we double team him. He winds up, he goes to blast through us. We split. He falls on the floor, and I said, "You have hit me for the very first and the last time." And that's when I realized that my little skinny body couldn't take getting ran over. So if I wasn't given a lick, I was getting out of the way. Yeah. And that's when 
right right there. Coach Beheim actually had a little seat when he used to come to the Kendall games. All the other coaches were upset because in our little gym, uh, Coach Beheim always came. You know, he sits to the closest point to the door as possible. So he sat up in the top of the in the corner. So all the other coaches would walk. He'd walk in. They'd look at him with envy, and he'd walk in. He'd sit down. He had his own spot there, and uh, it was so crazy because so I. I, uh, I ended up visiting um, Michigan State, Oklahoma State, Georgia Tech, Duke, and I went to a school out in Santa Clara. And I, when I was coming back home from Santa Clara, I remember thinking, every time I went on a trip, I never visited Syracuse, by the way. Every time I went on a trip, I remember thinking, man, I can't wait to get back home. And I was like, wait a minute. Uh, that's only been, you're only going there for the weekend. So at that point, I started seriously thinking about schools in New York State. Then I went down to St. Bonaventure. And Jimmy Sadlin was the head coach there. Yep. The teams were very, they had mature players in all the positions, but they didn't have a center. So in my, in my youth, I said, I want to start when I come to school. So I went to school, I wanted to go to school that didn't have a center. So we had Syracuse, St. Bonaventure. I, I went down to St. Bonaventure. It was fantastic. Had a great time down there. Met the coach, met the players. And I remember thinking, I live in Kendall, New York, and St. Bonaventure reminded me of like going to another small town area. I said, you know what? I want to try to make a step up. But the problem is, Coach Beheim is not the head coach. I said, I know I can get along with Coach Beheim great because he says like three words. He says, I need you to rebound. Uh, Good job, more rebounds. Uh, and if you score, that's just a cherry on top of the cake. I was like, okay, that's pretty easy. And uh, and then, and I'll never forget, it seems like it was like, like I made the greatest decision in the world, but I remember coming to school um, and my coach met me at the door and he held up the news. Jim Beheim, new head coach of Syracuse University. And I remember telling my coach all along, I said, coach, I really like Syracuse and Coach Beheim, but I don't, I don't know about the other guy because, uh, and the reason reason being is, Roy Danforth, every time we saw him, had his hair all slicked back, had a three-piece suit on, and he was always dressed to the nines. Yeah. When I went to Syracuse football camp, Coach Beheim actually came through one day, Eric, he had on like a plaid, he had on a, a, a golf shirt, a polo shirt, a pair of plaid golf shorts, and he had on a pair of $40 Converse low-cut leathers, and he was walking on the back of them. He had them on like slippers. Yeah. <laughs> Look at him go, man, that's laid back right there. I could, I'm all about that. And, and I've always thought that when you pick a coach, you got to pick somebody with characteristics similar to your dad. Like my dad said like 10 words in a row. If he said, if he did that, I'd be like in shock. Coach Behan came in, he's like, well, I need you to rebound. I need you to block shots and plug the middle. And if you score, I mean, it was like, he said like 10 words. It was simple. And I remember, it was, so I go through the school and my coach sees me and says, hey, but he's head coach now. We walk straight through Kendall High School to the coach, to his office, pick up the phone, call Coach Beheim and said, uh, I want to go to Syracuse next year. And he, uh, came down the next day and I signed. And it made me look like I was like the most intelligent guy in the face of the planet. And Eric, all of these times that I was going, so I got I got letters from like 90 major colleges across the country. So by that time I was already seven, seven feet tall and and I and I could and I could run with a soccer player because that's who I played with. There were basketball players were all soccer players in my division. And, but my mother, it was so funny because my mother was in charge. She would sit down and watch anytime a coach came in and talked to me. And my mother's pretty outspoken lady. So she sit there and they would start talking to her and she'd look right at them and go, you don't have to convince me. Man, you don't have to convince me. You have to convince him. And, and then they would start talking and they'd take me out to dinner and they'd buy me the biggest steak on the plate because I weighed like 178 pounds. And we sit there, and I take two bites, couldn't eat it. I just put it in the bag and take it home. And then finally, when it came down to me deciding to go to Syracuse, so I come home, I said, Mom, you know, why did you why did you never, you know, give me any opinion about where you, you know, where you wanted me to go or what or whatnot? 
And she looked right at me. She said, you don't understand. She says, I've already won. My goal was for you to, to be able to go to college and get a college education. You've got 90 schools trying to chase you down to give you a, a free scholarship to go to school. And she said, seeing that I know you so well, all I have to do is let you pick your own school because even if you hate it, you're so hard-headed, you'll go there and you'll finish. She says, so all I gotta do is sit back and let you pick your own school because I know you'll go there and you'll finish just because you picked it. And I went, man, she, she, brilliant. And, and that's how it all started. <laughs> and I went to Syracuse. Yeah, moms knows best. Come on now, you know that. Hey, she couldn't figure out why she wouldn't say anything. And I was like, and then when I finally picked it out, she just sat down and she said, honey, I wanted you to go to college and get a college education. And you got 90 coaches calling you. Eric, I used to get letters in, in Kendall, New York that had Roosevelt Bowie, Kendall, New York. And they would come to my mailbox. That's how small a town is that I, that I lived in. I would get letters like that. And it was, uh, it was quite, it was quite eye opening. And uh, then when I got to Syracuse, man, I mean, Coach Beheim never, there was never a doubt in my mind about his, his knowledge about the game of basketball. And like I said before, my only, my, I remember my friend, my, my first game at, at the, at the, at the, at the Mellow Center it was called the Manly Fieldhouse. And I walked in there and it was so loud. And I said, thank God I came here. I would not want to have to walk in here and play against it. It was, it was, it was the loudest place I'd been in my life. And it was, and it was, it was everything that I expected. And even more, the, the, the players that we got that, I mean, it started way back then. We were, once we all laced them up, we we're all brothers. And it stayed that way because uh, I always thought that back then, Coach Beheim's strategy was as long as the player, as long as the player is greater than the practice, you have everybody running your mouth. But the player's out there and he's thinking about dying, he doesn't care who scores the basket, just as long, just as long as he can stop and take a break. And that's that's how we built it up. We just, he said, I was, he said, I'm not the most knowledgeable coach. He said, I'm not the, I'm not the best coach in the nation, but you will be the team that's the, in the best shape in the nation. And I was like, okay. Let's get it done. So talk about that first year. I mean, you come in, you you average 11 and 8 as a freshman. And so, I mean, it, obviously it didn't seem like it took you a lot of time to adjust to the college game. I mean, were you are, were you ready? Did you feel ready right away when you came in? Uh, actually, you know what? It, there, was a, there was a moment. I mean, you, we jumped right into practice and everything was a competition. Uh, we had to run the mile under six. Then we used to have to do ball handling drills for, for a mile for time. Left hand, right hand between the legs. We, I mean, they were all stuff that I didn't understand. Then we had to do shooting drills, wearing gloves. So it was all for me. It was, it was learning new things and and adjusting. And see, you got to buy into. You got to trust what the coach is doing. And if you do that, you just believe in the process because he gave us a, a lot of things to understand. And um, I tell you what, I the only thing that I knew. So at, at a certain point. Let me back up. At a certain point, I started to get feeling a little overwhelmed. But this was like in the preseason. And uh, and Coach came in and he said, uh, I, I was feeling like like I had like an 800-pound gorilla on my back because I played at a, at, a, at a Class C school. Um, and we and we were, uh, we, we played, uh, I think we played 60, we, were, uh, we won 65 of 66 games. So, wow. but we, so we, we knew how to win and we knew how to work hard. And so just about it was before the first game, so it was maybe a month before the first game, I was a little, I was feeling complicated. And coach came in and, um, and, 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 and he, you know, he knew, you know, he's, he's looking at me so and he said, uh, he said, listen, if you will in practice work as hard as you work so hard that when you finish practice, you got to come to the locker room, and you got to sit there and look at your feet for 15 minutes before you can reach down and, get, and take your shoes off. He said, if you don't work that hard, he said, I'll teach you how to play basketball. He said, I can't teach you how to play hard, but I can teach you how to play basketball. And I remember sitting there thinking, and I was like, I'm not afraid of hard work. And when he walked out of that locker room, I felt like he took that 800-pound gorilla with him. At that point, my sole focus was on 
I said, somebody might be better than me, but they'll never outwork me on the floor. And then from that point and bit by bit, the thing that I really liked about what Coach Beheim would do is he would tell me something, you know, my interpretation of what he wanted me to do, I, I would go out there and do it. Like I you say attack the basket. Anytime I was like trying to score, I thought that was attacking the basket. And so at one point, so when I so at one point I got the ball, I crossed over, I took a dribble and I dumped it. And he came running out there. He's like, when I say attack the basket, that's what I want you to try to do. So it, and he would give me examples of each thing that he wanted me to do. And and it takes a little bit longer, but then when when I look over there and he'd be like, you know, crash the boards, attack the ball. I, I knew exactly what he was expecting of me because of the experiences that we had during practice. We had some of the wildest practices. Our teams were very well balanced and nobody wanted to give up. And coach used to finish practice, Eric, at a certain point, he would finish practice when there'd be a loose ball on the floor and there had to be at least six or eight guys diving on it. Once he saw that, he would start practicing and send us home. He wanted that intensity level. I remember him saying it was getting close to game time. He said to have enough first games. And, and it was when they, they mixed the JV team with the varsity team. So there's no longer JV team. So we had a bunch of guys out there. And he said, listen, I don't want anybody to worry about their playing time because when we start off, if you can play more than three minutes at a time, then you're not playing with the intensity that I want you to. That, that set the pace for what he was expecting out of us. So he said, I don't care where you're going, but you better be sprinting when you get there. And I was like, all right, I'm, I'm down with that. And that's how it all started. Who who is So who are you with that person you're going back and forth with in practice every day? Who are you competing against? Uh, for me, so we start out my freshman year. And I, you know, I got the, I got the handle of things. Uh, there was, I was playing against Bobby Parker at first. He was a big six nine guy, kind of big and strong. But every Eric, the only person I weighed that I weighed more than was there were two people. It was Ross Kendall. So I weighed one ninety. So I'm seven feet one ninety. Ross Kendall was 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 one eighty five at six two. And then there's Jimmy Williams, who was, he was maybe, I don't know five seven, but he was a, he was a he was a bolt of lightning. So. Those are the only two guys that I that I weighed more than. So in my mind, I was like, man, I can't, I can't overpower anybody out here. And I can't stand still and get hit by anybody out here. So at that point, I be, I, I, I went back to my my old mindset is anybody that came near me, I would stick them. And then when they had to, when they when they were coming after me, they'd have to chase me. I said, you can't stick and move. And that was <laughs> Yes, that's what, so that's what Lewis and I, that, that, that was our, that was our mode of survival. I remember when coach had us do those running drills, it was, Eric, there was, there were guys on the team, 6'6", 230, 235, big, strong, 6'4", jump out of the gym. And then there was me at 190 and Lewis at 168. And I, I hear the, I, used to, I remember watching Lewis out there playing and we do all our running drills. And I finished every drill behind him. I was like, wait a minute, don't let, don't let, don't let the green grass fool you. You might think he looks skinny. Every drill that I did, I finished behind him. I said, that little man right there is tough. And let me tell you something, trying to box out a guy that's, that's 6'9", about 168. I never completely missed a box out and fell on the floor more times in my entire life. I used to be so happy to see a guy like 230, 240. Because those guys, they would talk to me and they said, they said, Rose, if you're not getting a rebound and you beat your man down the floor, we'll look at you as the first option. Eric, I used to step on guys' foot. I'd pull their shorts down. I would, if the ball's on my side down the floor, I would run down the floor because the one thing that I knew for sure is I could run buck wild wide open for four for 40 minutes. And I said, I am going to run you until you die. I used to look at my, I'd be stretching the last three minutes before the game started. And I had a smile on my face looking at the guy I had to play for, that I had to play against. And this, people, I'm a, this is what I was thinking. I was thinking like, you don't even know yet. I'm going to run you until you die. And number two, I, I watched during warm-ups where he shot from. Because when you come out the warm-ups, you're going to shoot from all your favorite spots because you want to look good, right? 
I watched all the places he shot from, and those were all the places I stood when he tried to set up. I stood on his favorite spot, on my man's favorite spot. The whole the only thing I was looking at was where he took most of his shots from. He never got it. He, he might score, but he never got a shot from his favorite spot because I was always standing on it. And, I, and when he was coming toward me, I would take one step forward and hit him. So <laughs> I thought, was, if, my, if, my man, if my man is not upset with me, within 15 seconds after the game starts, I'm not doing my job. Because if we're on offense, I'm going to try to drive him down. Eric, I used to try to post up so low that I wanted to have to take one step in by, forward to take a layup. I wanted my man to be beat into submission behind me because even if I didn't get the pass, he was in terrible rebound position. So he's going to be upset with me because I'm going to run down as fast as I can. And I'm going to put my butt about three inches above his kneecap and I'm going to keep driving backwards until he either gets upset and throws me on the floor or, or, or he just lets me score. And I remember them saying, hey, you got to watch out for your elbows. I said, no, actually, you have to watch out for my elbows. You don't have the perfect solution. You let me catch the ball and score, and we won't have a problem. And now, going the other way, when he's running down the floor, I would beat him to the three-point line, which wasn't there, but to the top of the key, and I would always step up, and I'd chuck him while he's running up the floor. So the only thing he's thinking about at when that first play starts is he just got chucked by a little skinny kid on the floor. And then when he tried to hit me, I wasn't there anymore. I was like, stick and move. So that was my whole thing about basketball at that time. And then Coach Beheim and my teammates kind of rounded me into, you know, things that I, that I, that I could do. Like I could throw an outlet pass. My right-hand outlet pass, if you picked it up within 20 feet, was perfect, but I threw a sidearm. If you didn't, I can't tell you how many times I, I cleared out the bench because it would curve and everybody, everybody was diving out of the way. So for the first 15 minutes of every practice, you know the pitch back? I would start out right in front of the pitch back and I would throw right-handed, catch it left. The left-handed, catch it right. And then I'd take one step back until I was three-quarter court throwing left-handed, and right-handed at the pitch back. I had, those are things that I had to work on. And um, I tell you what, and then we also had this thing. So if whatever side of the basket you're on when you got the rebound, you always turn to the out, outside and you could throw either right-handed, you turn to the left-hand side, you could throw left-handed or two-handed. Yeah. But it was always to the outside. So there, there, there's certain things that they had us do systematically. And uh, I just learned them and that was the gospel. Where, where did uh so when did the Louie and Bowie name co come about and who who started it? You know what? It started out in uh it was so funny because we're, we 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 had a couple of games where uh, I don't remember one was Rutgers and I think another might have been a St. John's game. They were like the game of the week. And and Louis and I so I, I remember so I had 19 points and 19 boards. So I'm walking out so I I, I only know that because I was walking out of the gym and I heard him announce it over the or loudspeaker. And I'm about to go through the door and I hear Lewis Orr, 19 points and 19 boards. And I'm like, wait a minute. And so at some point, in this whole one of the, in the Daily Orange, somebody, there was a, um, there, there was a, uh, a caricature done. So Lewis and I were, were running down the floor at the same time and the picture was taken and we're in the exact same step. And it looked like we're, so they took the basketballs out, put us in top hats and canes and made us look like we're doing a vaudeville dance. And they, and we had you know, top hats and, we're, and, we're, and, they, and they said the Louis and Bowie show and it stuck. And that was it from that from then on. So so Daily Orange, credit to Daily Orange, huh? Hey, that that that's the first place that I saw because somebody was laughing about it. And I went and I looked at it, and it I, I've never I haven't seen the, uh, the the copy of it, but it was I still remember they had Lewis and I in the caricature. We weren't wearing uniforms; we were top hats and canes, and we were running in the same step, just like in that that famous picture that they have us and. Uh, Hey, that's where it was. We just, 
And the thing about it was we were, we we're just very good at playing off one another. Because Lewis said, I would always draw the double team and I could get the ball within two or three feet of the basket. And if I missed, the reason I never didn't know he had 19 points is because if I missed a shot, he would, he would tip it in so quick. There's no, like I'm carrying three guys on my back and I get to the basket. I'm throwing guys down and stepping on them. And I miss a shot and he tips it in. And he scores in like 0.2 seconds. I'm like, wow. So he was. You just took all the defense from him <laughs> so he could just tip it in. <laughs> yep, I tell you, it was it was great. Also, because he would also, it was so funny because Coach Bayham would decide how he wanted the game to go, and then we would walking from the the bench area after telling the coach walking out for the jump ball, we would get together and we decide who had the weakest link, who had the man that didn't that didn't that could not play them, and whoever that person was, that person would get four or five, six balls in a row. And normally it was who was playing against the shooter because shooters, they won't get two fouls in a row. And we would put Dale Sackerford, we put at six, six, we put him on the box. And we give one, two, three, four, five passes in a row. And next thing you know, either, either their shooter is going to have two fouls or they're going to let him score 10 points. And whoever, and the thing about it was, the model was, if it's not broken, don't fix it. If I keep throwing a ball in there and they can't stop you, Ed Moss would say, I'm going to keep throwing a ball in there. And, uh, and Lewis, we had, we had this thing down. So Lewis would pop to the high post, and I would look like I was trying to get in front of my man to, to call for the ball for him to get the high post, to pitch it to the side and get it to, to, to me, right? Yeah. So I'd go up there, I'd be called, I'd call it, and as soon as he caught it, he would just throw it back up towards the rim, and I would just jump up and drop it in. So you just we, you go up could, flat? You flat and then spin off, really. Yeah, exactly. So he would flash. He would be the high post. I'd flash to the mid post. Right. Like I was like, they didn't know how to throw the ball. So when they would throw the ball to him, all I would do is just spin off. And he would literally, many times, he would just catch it and pat it up towards the rim. We played together so long that we had, uh, hey, it was like, he, he could, you could see out of the court. I could see out of, if he was, when he was going up to get the ball, if he, if he, if I saw the whites in his eyes, I knew he saw me because he was looking at me. And then I would just, so my job was just, was just to get my, get close up to my man to give him a little bump and then to go to the basket. You know, we wouldn't release to the basket without a look. They, they told us to seek contact first, give a little shot. How you doing? And then, and then go. To contact. It was all about that, Eric. That's all I, that's all. That's all I understood. So and they used to go call ahead, me sorry. General Giant because I smile all the time when I did it. It still hurts whether you smile or not. But the referees, if you frown all the time, the referees call fouls. If you're always smiling, they're always like, oh. And the other guy's mad. They're like, I right, gotta be quiet. Just play the game. Now, did you foul out a lot though? You know what? I um I think I probably averaged four point four fouls in my career. I, I, I'm a firm believer in getting and getting the, most out, getting the most out of my <laughs> out of my fouls. And to be quite honest, we played we played a lot of man to man because we had we had some ball hawking defensive monsters out there. We went back to the zone when I was getting foul trouble. So, and we became pretty good at that. And uh, and, I, and coach kind of deducted like, hey, instead of waiting until Rosie gets in foul trouble all the time, every now and then let's throw that because uh, we go back into the zone, and we just kind of plug it up because everybody would step up. I mean, that's the funny thing about back then, if you tried to cut through the basket, whoever was closest to you gave you a shot. It could have yes. been Horn, it could have been Marty Head, it could have been Ed Mark, it could have been Lou. Whoever you ran past, I hit everybody. So I give you the first one, and then the next person you ran past, you got to him too. You could not run through the paint without getting a shot from somebody because we had this communication. I said, listen, guys, from the high post, I used to tell the guards, from the high post, if you let that man come running in from the high post and I'm, and I'm boxing out, a running man will always get to the rebound faster than a man standing still. So I said, all I need you to do when that guy goes past him is give him a little shot 
give a little hip, give a little bump, and then he can't get a running start. And I said, then after that, I'm all yeah. set. And we talk about smart players. Marty Head, Marty Head couldn't jump over six sheets of paper. And he was not the fastest guy on the floor. Please tell me why he had more breakaway layups than anybody in the history of Syracuse University. Marty Head would see me start going up for an offensive rebound with nobody around me. And he'd step on his man's foot and push him down and, and take off. So when I turned around to the outlet, Marty's like, Marty's like this far from the basket. I'm like, how does he do it? Marty knew, Marty, Marty wouldn't wait for you to get the rebound and turn around and outlet. Marty knew that if the outlet went to the point guard, Marty knew if he could cross half court before anybody. So he was already, it was like his man was playing checkers and Marty was playing chess. Because Marty said, if I can, nobody's looking at him. They're looking at me. They're looking at Lewis. They're looking at Shaq. We're down there elbowing and throwing people on the ground. So he'd step on his man's shoe, pull his pants down, and take off and, and score layups. I said, like, how do you do that? <laughs> that, that, on, I play with the bus. Pulling the pants down? Rosie pulling uh, his pants <laughs> Listen, he would pull it. He would grab the shorts. He would pull them all the way off, but he'd, he'd pull it like, Marty would grab, like, if Marty was running this way, he might run past you and pull your shorts that way to get you off balance, but he's gone. I used to go like, oh. Hey, that's some of the funniest stuff, but that's, that's what it was about. It was, now, during practice, Eric, when I tell you there were sparks flying every day, there were sparks flying every single day because it was my job to let everybody know that the starting position was mine. I didn't want there to be any doubt in anybody's mind at any particular time. So if we're doing a shooting drill, if we're doing a rebounding drill, if we're doing a see how far you can dive on the floor and slide on your chest drill, the mentality of our guys was we don't, we don't want to do a drill. We want to master it. And with that mentality, uh, it, it was it was crazy. We had a very balanced team, and we would just – Coach Behan would have to stop us the day before the game when there was, like, eight guys on the floor, and we'd be like – we'd get up off the floor, like, we'll see you on Monday. <laughs> we'll finish this on Monday because we got to play together now on the weekend. But on Monday, we'll be right back here. And I'll never forget in my locker, so we had Red Bruin, Eric Sanford, and Ron Payton. Both of those have 40-plus-inch verticals, right? I'd be at my locker, tie my shoes up, and I'd look up. There'd be a shadow, and I'd look, look up, and they'd be standing there with their arms on each other every day, and they'd go like, Rosie, one of us is going to dunk on you today. And I would stand up, tuck my shirt in, and I said, that just means one of y'all going to the hospital, and I walk right past them. And they're like, oh, man, that's wrong. I said, said, that's wrong. I said, no, that's not wrong. What's wrong is you telling me that you're going to come in there and try to dunk on me. I said, if you're smart, you get your dunk in there and then talk about it, which still might be hazardous to your health, but hey, anyway. But I was like, you can't, I said, you can't walk over to a shot blocker and tell him that one of you three is going to dunk on him because in my mind, when I turn around, I see any one of you three, I'm not even going for the block. I'm running for the other, I'm running for the other goal line. It's going to be like, <laughs> so I've always felt that playing the center, playing the center position is how far you can project what you can do because everybody knows I, I can't play the whole, the whole, the whole area, but I can make you think I can cover the whole area. And then when you get in the area, do you really want to run into me? So, and this was also, cause I knew that everybody should ask me, what can Roosevelt Bowie do? And I said, they said, what can Roosevelt, is Roosevelt Bowie going to do against this team? I said, Roosevelt Bowie doesn't have to play against that team. They have to play against Syracuse University. And I'm going to tell you right now, they're going to catch a hard way to go. Because we play, we would not let you separate any, we would not let you separate and talk about any one of us because you got all of us. And that was, that was a strength right there. And it's to, to this day. And um, I came to Syracuse. I didn't follow basketball. I started playing basketball. So I wasn't a, a fan of Syracuse. But I did see, um, uh, I saw that they went to the Final Four. Because Eric, I was out. I was out shooting and fishing. I, I'm upstate New York guy. Then I got to Syracuse, 
and I became a fan of hard work and they showed me how to play basketball in a certain fashion. And then I'll, I'll never forget when I came back, um, I missed, so I missed, I graduated in 1980. I missed the next 16 years of Syracuse basketball because there was no coverage. I managed to get back in 1996 when, when they were in the final four, I landed in New York city and the game was about half over. So there's no way for me to get out there too. So I started watching with John Wallace and, and starting from that point, I had to like do my research to go back. So I always tell John all the time, I was like, we're, we're kind of like, we're from uh, the Rochester area, but John grew up as a fan of Syracuse basketball and then became a player at Syracuse. I grew up learning how to play basketball, played at Syracuse University, and then I follow Syracuse University sports. I don't follow anything else. I'm not, I have no interest. And in the NBA, I follow teams where Syracuse guys are playing. And when they come out of the game, uh, I change the channel. <laughs> that's yeah. that, that that's just the way that's just the way it is. That's Syracuse. That's Syracuse. That's Syracuse <laughs> through and through right there. Through and through it. And there's there's no doubt. And I have no I have no problem. There was a, I'll never forget. So my younger sister went, I put her through Syracuse when I when I came back from Italy. So she's 10 years younger. And uh at, at one point um Syracuse didn't go to the to the tournament for for some reason, and uh, so somebody called me the next day and wanted to get my opinion about the NCAA tournament. And I answered the phone and I said, um, "The NCAA tournament has been canceled this year." They're like, "What do you mean?" I was like, "I have no other interest." And I I said, "I'm sorry." I have, and they said, "Well, thank you very much for your time." I when when Syracuse is not in there, I could give less. They might as well cancel the whole NCAA tournament. By the same token, when they're in there, it, it, it's Eric. It, it's a pleasure to watch, to watch, because I I I was there for Coach Beheim's first win. I was there for his first loss, and I was there for his 100th win. So I never forget the first time that I that, that we lost. I hadn't lost a game in like three years. So we lose a game. And I go over and I apologize to Coach Beheim. I was like, Coach, I'm sorry. And then he's like, sorry for what? And I was like, I think I had like 12, I had 13 and 12. I had a double-double. And he said, sorry for what? I, said, I don't know. That. I thought, what do you do when you lose? I, I have lost like three. He goes, no, 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 keep. You're doing just fine. Keep, keep working. I was like, okay. I was like, wow. So it's that whole that. And, and he, he, he laid down a couple of ground rules. He's like, He's like, number one, there will be no, no, the, the quickest way for you to get on the bench is for you to yell at one of your teammates. He said, that's my job. If anybody needs to be yelled at, that's my job. That's the quickest way to get off the floor and on the bench. He said, the second quickest way is to come out and talk during my time out. He said, because if I take you out, I don't care what you did because evidently it didn't work because I had to call a time out. So I don't care what you did. Don't come out here trying to tell me what you're doing. I was like, I was like all this stuff made sense to me. So, I mean, every, so every was, year you got every, every year you got better, right? Like, I mean, your your senior year, you dominated. You're averaging like I think like 16 and 12 or 13 or something like that. But who do you credit to besides yourself? You know, just your development from year to year and, and your confidence going getting better and better. I'd have to say, uh, Coach Fine, Coach Fine, Coach Fine worked with me in, in two fashions because I was like a country boy. I didn't, when I came to Syracuse, I didn't have a watch. I should, I could tell, I could tell time within twenty minutes by looking where the sun was in the sky. I grew up out of the country. Yeah. He got me down there. Had to, you know, he said, "Listen, it's important for you to get your to get your classes. We should go to class." You had to give a sheet of paper that said, "I will be at every class, and if I'm not, call this number." And then it says, and he will be missing the next day because he'll be running the mile under six minutes all day. <laughs> yeah, bird. Yeah. I, I, I can I can tell you right now how many days I missed of class when I went to Syracuse University that had nothing to do with when I was in town. None, because I didn't want to run the mile under six minutes. And he said, not once, but you be doing it all day. You want to skip something, you can skip the class the next day. So. 
he, he let us know how important it was to to practice, to, to be there on time, um, to take it, and, and he wanted us to be tough. I mean, you know, Coach Coach Beheim set us down there, and, and Coach Fine had us do all these drills for boxing out, all these drills for um, getting the ball, holding the ball, outlegging the ball, um, and so that that structure in, in the that. I kept making, I kept clearing the bench out every time I would throw my sidearm pass. The hone me into, you know, being consistent. Um, when I got the rebound, they never wanted me to throw it, throw it backwards. If the ball had always go forward. Um, and so just, just the fact that, that I had to become tough. One thing that, that coach, I used to have the habit of bringing the ball down all the time. And they Stop that habit in about a day and a half because at one point he said, if Rosie brings the ball down below his waist, you can follow him, but it won't, won't count as a foul. Okay. So two things happened. All of our scrimmages I wanted to win, right? When I brought the ball down, I was, I was, I was, I was a weak, I was a weak point of our team. So I would cause our team to lose the ball because they could, if my hands were down, they could. They could hold on to him and they wouldn't call right. us a foul. The second thing was it made me mean in the round snake because you might hold my hand down, but when I got my arm loose, I had to give you some of this African soup bone. <laughs> <laughs> I got to the point, if somebody held my arm and didn't run, they got blasted. And so all of this, so I said, okay, so then after a while, it was like, I'd walk around, I'd keep my hands, my hands never went below my shoulders, no matter where I was in the paint. And it was, it was because, like, I wanted to win these scrimmages that were happening, and if I put my hands down and they held them, I know it was, it was my fault. So I was like, okay, we got to solve this problem. So just things like that and being tough. Um, the guards and the centers were all worked out together, so I had to do dribbling drills, I had to do passing drills, I had to do all of those things. So the thing that I really liked the most about uh, going there is I played 16 years as a professional, and I knew in Europe, I knew that I could I could pop out and pass the ball well enough to relieve the pressure for our guards and help us win. I could rebound well enough to help my team win, or I could score well enough to help my team win. And if need be, I could block shots and protect the basket well enough to help make my team win. I just had to decide which one of those my team needed at that particular time. I said, you can probably stop me from doing any one of one or two of those five things, but you can't stop me from doing all three. You can't stop me from doing all of them. And I only need to be able to do one or two of them well to help my team win. So that, that gave me the confidence um, after going through the, 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 the drills and, 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 and stuff that I did at Circus. When I went, when I went to Europe, I was just like, I was like, there, there's, I'm not afraid to work hard. I'm not afraid to practice. Eric, I, I'll never forget. I, I, I went to my, my team owner when I got to my first team in Italy, and I said, can I stay after and shoot? And they're like, sure. So I stayed after, I stayed after practice. I had a boom box out here about this big. I brought it, put my tape on, put some music on, and I stayed in that gym for another 45 minutes. They're looking at me like I had a third head. They're like, what? All this guy wants to do is, I said, listen, I don't have to go to school. I'm getting paid handsomely, and I can get in the gym anytime I want to. <laughs> what is there? Any, is there anything better in life? Uh, I tell you what, it was it was amazing. So, yeah, it was it, it and it, it all started when I was at Syracuse. I remember thinking, I know that I'm with a special group of guys that that would put that would that would lay it down for any anybody out there on that team, and, uh, and still. You know, as that time passed, and, and 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 I have the same relationship with with guys in in, in your team or or, or with, with with DC and all. Of, I went back and I tell you what, you might have, when I saw you when I watched you guys play, you would you would have thought I was out there playing. I had to come home and take a shower because that's so <laughs> that's participate that that how to participate with with Syracuse basketball. That's it. That's how it was. So, Rosie, I got a, I got a question though. Why? So, because you, you got drafted, you got drafted by Dallas. 
And you, I mean, you would have been, you would have had a long NBA career. I mean, just how, I mean, you could run, you could jump, you could, you block shot, you, you could move. I mean, that's the way the game was, was going upwards, you know? And so why, why did you decide to go overseas for, instead of staying in the NBA? So these, so our sophomore year, Syracuse University went to Italy. We went there, we played in these tournaments, we played in three tournaments. And in the first two tournaments, I made the all-tournament team. And the third tournament, I was the MVP of the tournament. Now, we were playing with their pros. And I was seven feet, I was seven feet about, about 200 pounds at that time. And so um, the Europeans are really good at following people once they get to meet them. So, so I come back, and I, I play. We, we, uh, we do pretty well. Going into January, I think we're ranked number two in the country. Played against Purdue number one. We go there, we beat them. And you know, then there's all this talk. And then I end up getting drafted by Dallas. And so, and, I'm, and, I, and it was an expansion year. I mean, that's literally, good. that's literally the worst team in the league. Yeah. <laughs> For a long time. So you got to remember, six, uh, in, in Canada, we're 65 and one. At Syracuse, we won 100 games, we lost 18 games. I didn't lose 20 games in damn near a decade. And if I went to the Mavericks, I was going to have to learn how to lose. So keeping that in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, I'm not afraid I'll go there. I'll work hard. So I ended up, Norm Sign, dude, the GM of, uh, of the Mavericks, had a camp up in the Adirondacks. So he gave me a call. He was up in the Adirondacks. I hopped in the car. I drove up there. Uh, Tommy Lagarde was up there and a couple of other guys. We, we, you know, we did a little, we played a little basketball and stuff. And so, um, and something that Tommy, that, uh, that Noam Sandu said to me, as soon as he said it, I knew I was going to Italy. So he, uh, so we're up there talking and, he, and I said, you know, I've been to, uh, I've traveled to, I know I've got to talk to some people from Italy. So I you know it's possible I may end up in Italy. And he looked at me and he goes, I know it's always been your dream to play in the NBA. And anybody that knew anything about me knew it had always been my dream to be a successful businessman. I went to class every day. I mean, that, that's from day one. And that guy looked right in my face and he said that to me. I said, Jiminy Cricket, my life is in the hands of a guy that didn't even take the time to find out if you would have asked anybody that would have told him that. I started playing basketball when I was 14. How can it have always been my dream to play in the NBA? It was my dream to play basketball, to get my education, to go into business, to be able to work for myself. He didn't even know that. And I was like, holy crap, he did, this guy doesn't know anything about me. And I, when, I, when he said that, I just smiled and I turned around. And when I was getting in the car, I was like, I'm going to Italy. Because they had sent somebody over at the beginning of this, at the, at the end of the school year. And they called me like every couple of weeks and they would, offer me more money so and in Italy you the, the the full season is 32 games you play one game a week yeah. and the same money that Dallas offered me and I played 60 games less or, or 50 games less a season so it was in my mind okay you know what I'm gonna go over there and and, and, and round out my game. I was pretty scared because at the time guys were going over there and they were over they were get, getting drinking habits, overdosing, and all that kind of crazy stuff. And I and I remember sitting down there and I said, "Listen, I went through college. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs." I said, "Why am I going to start doing something that I'm not accustomed to doing? You know, that's not the way that I was raised." So, hey, I grabbed my uh, I grabbed a little backpack and a pair of sneakers put my family Bible in my bag and my boom box. And uh, I went, I went over to Italy and that's where uh, yeah, it all happened because those, when he said, I know it's been your dream to play in the NBA. I was like, Holy crap. I was like, well, I know I'm going this first year. And I remember the first, I remember my first two years in Italy. And then it was like the 13th and the 14th year. They just went, <laughs> you know, so what happened to, to, for, for that to happen though? That first year, it was just like you fell in love with with the the plane and the the lifestyle over there, or what? So so this is what happened. So I get there and I I'm a mama's boy. I was homesick, Eric. I remember sitting out. I was on the Adriatic, sitting out there looking out on the Adriatic. It was a beautiful night, and I was so homesick. 
I felt like I was going to cry. And I said, boy, if you start crying, you will like melt away to nothing. Everything will just come out of you. So I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta, be, I can hold this out because you gotta remember there was no phone calls. The only kind of communication was a letter that took two weeks. Yeah. To get there. So uh, I remember sitting down there and because uh, Eric, I kept looking for the things in Italy that were worse than they were in the States. You know, the communication factor, um, all of those kind of things. That's so after about after about a week or so, I said, hold it. If I keep looking at all the things that are looking for all the things that are that are worse, I'll find them. But guess what? I'll be freaking depressed. So at that point, I said, you know what? I'm gonna start looking for the things that the Europeans do that are different and possibly better than things than the way things are done in the States. So that's when I started doing it. And Eric, it was like night and day. I started it, my whole outlook changed. I became more curious. And I'm gonna tell you, so I got, so I get to Italy, I land and the, the team owner and the general manager meet me at the airport. We get in the car, he drop, we go out to dinner. They take me to my house. They give me the keys to uh, an apartment with a balcony so big I surround my bicycle around on it. And I'm on the Adriatic. And they gave me the keys to a Mercedes. They gave me two sheets of paper. They said, this paper, this is your practice schedule. This is your game schedule. The restaurant is down there. The gym is down there. And they shook my hand and they were gone. And they didn't come look for me. They didn't come. It was like, it was, it was, it was a sink or swim time. I didn't speak. I know how to say, I know how to say and chow. That was it. And I tell you what. I figured it out. And then after a while, I said, you know what? I couldn't talk to anybody, but you, the one thing you always saw me with is a pad and a piece of paper. You do not want to go against me in Pictionary. I can, I can communicate anything I want to anybody on the planet with a pen and a piece of paper. So... <laughs> So I'm sitting in my apartment over there and I'm like, man, okay. I said, that's it. I get my Mercedes keys. I got a pad and I wrote down because in, in Europe, all of the, all of the towns have uh, a center of town marked on the map. So I wrote down Centro and I drove to the autostrada and I held it up to the lady and I went, and she went and I went and I was gone. And so for, <laughs> For every, so we played on Sunday. We had Monday. We had to be back for practice Tuesday afternoon. I went to a different city. I would drive to the center of town, and at the center of town, it's a zona pedonale. You can't go there by car. You have to park the car and go there by bicycle or walk. And so they always they always had a parking area there. So I would park. I'd go stay in a five star hotel, and I'd ask the concierge where's the best restaurant. And I did that for the. I did that for like a year. So. I know more restaurants, hotels, and cities than most Italians do. That's but how you got to do it. There are not three people in this country that know Italy better than I do. And then I learned how to speak the language. And uh, it was so funny because I was with, uh, I played with Wilbur Holland. He, he actually played in Chicago. He's a 6'2 guard. He was 32 at the time. And I ate, and I would eat at his house for like the first four months. Then his wife went home, and we were like, "Oh crap!" So we go to the restaurant. This is my scenario. I go to the restaurant. As I'm walking in, I'm looking at what people are eating, and I learned how to say, "What is that?" I was like, "Cosa questo?" And then the guy would say it to me, and I would learn the name of that meal, and then I would eat it for like a week, and then I said, "Okay, boy." You got to learn these meals faster than I'm not eating one meal for a whole week. So <laughs> then I started getting better at that. Um, and, and, it, and it was, and I started noticing that when I would always, since I had this big apartment by myself, I'd always leave the, the television on when I was going to sleep. And they were playing, like I watched Batman. There would be like all the, the, all the movies from back in the States, but they'd be speaking Italian. And I started noticing that after uh, about two months, I when I woke up, I I would be dreaming about what was on television. 
I was dreaming about what was on television. I was like, how's it possible? I don't speak Italian. But subconsciously, I started to understand. And then uh, I started watching cartoons. And by watching cartoons, that's how cartoons are designed to teach our kids how to speak. So I started watching Italian cartoons. And four months later, and I, I got to be perfectly honest with you, because I was, so my, my routine for, my pregame routine was, I would get up that morning, I'd have breakfast, and I'd go outside, and I'd wash my Mercedes. That's how I, I, that's how I would relax. I would, I'd clean it up, I'd spit shine it, and I'm down there watching. This lady starts walking towards me. She's absolutely stunning. She walks right up to me, and she talked for like five minutes. I didn't have my pad, my pen, nothing. And then I couldn't understand a word she said. She turned around, she walked away. And I said, that's it. I'm learning how to speak Italian. And four months later, I was speaking. <laughs> so you, you don't want to, you, you're not going to miss out on that again. Like that, and I, you talk about, you talk about feel absolutely helpless. I'm standing down there and she walked across the whole place to come and talk to me and didn't speak a, a lick of English. And, and, and then she, she stood there as long as she could and finally she had a frustrated look on her face and she walked away. And I turned and I looked in the mirror and I said, Mr. Bowie, that will never happen again. <laughs> and from that point on, that, that, that language went into my head and it was like, I was like a sponge. And, uh, and the, the fact that I wanted to learn the language really opened up the hearts of the people in the area. So one of the other big things was, so I, I was out there washing my car one day and about 15 kids came running over to me. And they're like, uh, Senior Boy, yeah. And they're trying to, and I couldn't understand them. The little boy takes me by the hand. He's there, there probably is a, there's probably 15 of them. They were eight or nine years old. So they they take me over, and there was these trees, and there was this fruit up on the tree. And they had picked all the fruit that they could reach down low, and they brought me over there. So I picked all the fruit up high. For them, and I gave them the fruit, and then one little boy broke it open and let me taste it. It was phenomenal. It was called cocky, but it was a really sweet. Um, and I understood what they were talking about. So, so he, so, so I had that little group of guys. So every time, and I had a bike. My my president from Syracuse University, when I graduated, they bought me a bike. I, I wanted a bicycle, so I used to ride my bicycle all over the place. So these kids would see me anywhere, anywhere, and they'd come over and sit down and want to talk to me. So that was the first fifteen, and then after that. Their parents would come over and say hi. And then, so by, the, by my third, I, my, first, my first game, my first practice in Italy, Eric, I walked in the door, got my practice gear. I walk in the gym, there are 5,000 people in practice. Wow. So what team, what team was it? What team was it? I played for a team on Pesaro, Scavolini Pesaro. They made, the, the team was owned by, a, 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 they made kitchenware. But it was uh, and it, it's a, it's um, one of the older teams in Italy, and I walked in there. And, but it's a seaport town, so when basketball season starts, the, everybody in the gym were either restaurant or hotel owners for a seaside resort. So by September, the seaside is closed. Everybody in that gym, everybody in that gym. I walked in there. I looked down. I was like got my uniform and I looked around I was like no this is practice I was like they come here for practice like listen you will never find another place like this in the world 5,000 people there for our first practice wow and it, it was crazy it was uh it was, it was it was a pretty wild experience but that uh once you show them that you're willing and, and I that you're willing to go out and I had breakfast I, I had lunch and dinner with two guys from my team like every day and we talked and we talked all the time. And the, the one gentleman that I started playing with, his name was Walter Magnifico. He ended up being Mr. Europe like 12 years later. And he, and I remember he, he, he asked me like 5,000 questions because so when I first got there, he says, I was, I was reading about you in the Sports Illustrated and now you're here in front of me. This dude used to ask me like 4,000 questions. So in practice, I would break him down. I'd beat him with a move and he'd ask me to explain it to him. I'd explain it to him. And he'd break it down and break me down and use it on me the next play. And I, so then I said, I got to deal with you. I'll explain my moves 
after practice. You're not. <laughs> I'm not telling you in practice every because he would he's like a sponge. He go down and do it, and we and we spent a lot of time together. And whenever I went out, he would have you go out with a group of them, and uh, that's when I really understood the culture. Um, you don't even if everybody in a like I said, if there's 20 people in a room and 19 of them speak English, and one of them and one of them doesn't speak English, then all of your conversations are in Italian. Because the only, they, they think the only reason for you to speak in English would be to say something you just want him to understand. And that's considered really rude. So that's how it all got started. So what, what do you, besides the basketball part, I mean, what did you really take from that experience being overseas? What, it was almost 12 years ago? Right? Yeah, I was. So I, I, I played there 13 years, but I lived there 16 years. So after my second year, I bought a home and I was basically for the next 14 years, I lived in this particular town and that was my home. Um, the thing that I took that I took away from it, basketball is a language in and of itself because I could not understand what any of them said, but when we played basketball together, we played fluidly as if, as if we'd known each other forever. So yeah. basketball in and of itself is a language of its own. And, I, and they could watch the way that I played and they, and they adjusted their games to the way that, that I played the game. And I adjusted my game to the way that they played. Um, and it also, I mean, I was terrified when I first went over there, but I said, you know what, you can't be a sissy all your life. You got to step up, you've been to school, you get out of the real world. And um, I got out there and I made the best of it. So we finished in fifth place the first year. And the second year we lost in the finals against Mike D'Antoni's team. Mm. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it was, and they had a really, they had a really well-established team over there. And I, and I went to this particular team and, uh, so I, I learned all the stuff that I learned about, about basketball and hard work and, 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 and defense and offense and playing with team and playing with my teammates. I was able to verify that it makes no difference what country you go to basketball is basketball and if, if you're a good hearted person, you can find my grandmother used to sell all the time and birds of a feather fly together. And basically, what it meant is people of your like mind can see who you are and they will, they will present themselves to you. And, I, and I, I, I met a lot of great people, I have a lot of great friends to this day that, um, that they were in Europe. My, guy, my man Rosie is dropping gems all around. So, Rosie, I got, I got a question for you. And this right here, I know this means a lot to you. I mean, like you said, you you grew up in the country, a uh, small town. You get recruited to Syracuse, a legend at Syracuse, 12, 13 years in Europe, a legend over there. But then, you know, after it's all said and done, after you're done playing, you're able to come back to Syracuse and, and have your jersey retired. And, and, you know, it's up in the dome forever. You know, those are the, the greatest players of all time. Uh, at Syracuse University. What did that mean to you to have your jersey retired? Well, the, uh, you know, the, the, one of the most amazing things that happened to me, so I, so I graduate in 1980, and two weeks after I graduated, I was in Italy for the next almost 20 years. So for all intents and purposes, Syracuse fans never saw, saw or heard from me for 16 years. I, so I retired in 1996, I come back and I get the Vic Hansen Award um, for citizenship. And it's literally the first time that I've been around these people in almost 20 years. Eric, when I walked in, I walked into the room, there were like 800 people there and you would have thought I just left yesterday. I, yeah. I was, it was, it was like, I just like walked around the corner and I came back. It was the most amazing thing that, that I that I ever felt. And I and as far as getting my uh, jersey retired, the most beautiful thing about that was so Lewis and I when it got them retired together. So they they're telling them how many tickets we had, we invited to come to the uh, to the ceremony. So I told Lewis who I had invited to come to the ceremony, and we were so close, we had all the same friends. So we said, Oh, I just have to bring my I just have to bring my my family because you've invited everybody that I know that we used to live next to one another. We practiced together. Our lockers were next to one another, but we, we respected one another. And we, um, it, it was, it was so cool because the day before 
the alumni club put on this little get together up in the uh, in the hotel that we were staying at, and all of all of our friends came up there. It was supposed to be from from six to nine. They literally turned the lights off. We we're all sitting up there. It was like ten minutes. It was like ten minutes to twelve. We we're still sitting there talking about when we we're like when we we're just talking about the good old days. And I and, and I said, you know what? It, it can't get any better than this moment. Having all your friends around you that that uh, being there for this specific occasion. And Lewis and I were talking. We we're like, yeah, this is uh, this is pretty special. But so, yeah, but it, you know, we're all cool and macho and everything. And let me tell you something, we got out there and when they started dropping those, they, they dropped those uh, uh, those covers and we saw our numbers up there, it got real, real quick. It was like, wow, it was, it, it was, it, it was, it was such a privilege and an honor and not, not only to have it done, but to go in with a guy that, uh, with a guy that was a, a big part and we spent a lot of time together. And knowing the center position, you can't, there's nothing that I can do by myself. So you already know that my team had to be behind me for me to be successful. And another thing that happened, my, the, the point guard from my high school team, we've been friends for 50 years this year. He came to that event. And when they, when they actually started uh, showing my uniforms, his wife told me, told me that he he had to sit down. He, he said he cried like a baby. He said, I've been with him since day one. He said, I, he, said he couldn't even stand up. He just he just sat down there and he was bawling, crying like a baby. She was rubbing him on the back. He said he didn't even see it. He said he looked up and he saw him lowering it down. He's like, holy smokes. From, from We met when we were 13 years old and we've been friends ever since. And he said it, it was, and that's when it all kind of dawned on me. And uh, I was trying to talk and Lewis came over and put his hand on my back. And I, you know, when they get that little the corner of your mouth, they're like, <laughs> I was like, we were all, we were talking about how we weren't going to be emotional about it. Like, this is cool because, you know, it's great going with your friend and everything. But when it actually happened, it was amazing to be out there with my friends and family. And then I don't know if you remember, but at that particular time, Pearl actually walked out on the floor and walked over to us and gave us a big hug out there. So it made it even more special. Um, and and, I, and I, I say that because I never got a chance to see Pearl play because that was my whole career in Europe. And there was no way I could see him play. So I didn't know what a great player he was. I had to come back and watch game film of when Pearl played, when, when uh, Derek Coleman, Billy Owens, all, when all those guys, I had to go back and watch game film because at that time, I was in the thick of my own of my own career, so that made that made it even more special. So yeah, that that was. It's, and it, it, we said it was nothing that we had we'd expected, but it's something that we're really that we're really proud to accept. And and you impacted you know a lot a lot more people than yourself. You know, what I mean, like you said, your your best friend didn't even see. He started crying, so it means a lot to more people than than you know that's that's special right there man that's once in a life that's forever yeah, it was i tell you what it was uh it was it was a, it was a it was a, a beautiful moment and um and, and like i said my whole family was there they were there they were they're out there on the floor they were standing by me and uh it was uh you know I, it, it was something that um in my my net my great my great great nephew he uh he walked over to me as a little tight. He walked over to me and he and he pulls on my hand, and I said, and his and his name is Priest. And I said, what is it, Priest? He said, Uncle, I want to be just like you when I grow up. He was he was about about big as a bottle. And he looked up. He's like, I want to be just like you. And I was like, wow. It's one thing to, to do it when you're doing it, and then to have a family member who he. he I'm his uncle. He didn't know. He didn't know I played basketball. He, I'm his uncle that takes him out fishing to have fun and to do things. And he got a chance to see, get a glimpse of, you know, of my life before he was even here. All those things were, were kind of important, and and it kind of kept and it helps to helps to help helps to raise the kids of uh of the of the of the of the, of the younger generation for the possibilities of what, of what can happen for them because. 
you know, Kendall, Kendall's like 1,200, 1,300 people. And yet, and yet there you, if you wrote Roosevelt, boy, Kendall, New York on, a, on, a, on an on a envelope, it would get to my house, you know? So when, if you do things the right way and you treat people the right way, um, you know, many, many positive and fantastic things can happen. Again, I'm telling you, this man just dropping gems, not only about basketball, just about life in general, but let's, let's transition for a second. Um, this will be one of the last questions. What do you think about this year's team? Uh, we got, okay, we got, we got the Bayheim brothers. Okay. We got Cole Schweider coming in the freshman, Benny Williams. I think we got good depth at the center position uh, with Barama back healthy, Jesse, and then, and then Frank. Um, and then obviously we got the guards with Joe and, and then transfer Samir coming in. I think he gives us some good depth. So what are your expectations for this year? How far can we go? How good are we going to be? Well, you know what? I, as, as everything was, as everything was taking place, you know, some people were you know, saying, Oh my gosh, everybody's leaving. These people are, you know, what's going on. And I, and I'm a, I'm a firm, but I'm a very, very firm believer in, when you're when you're a Syracuse guy, you're a Syracuse guy. You decide to you decide to leave, then you're not. You know, I I, I wish you well, but then you're not. You know, you you were here, but you're not here anymore. Um, so my, you know, understanding what I know about the game of basketball, you know, for for a talent, super talented players to leave, I'm like. You're, you're if you're if you're in a coaching staff, you got to go. Holy smokes, my my career, my coaching job depends on the whim on the whims of eighteen and nineteen years old, uh, of 18, 19, 20 year old. And I distinctly remember when I was that old. Thing, and I was a rather humble child, but I didn't have a freaking clue. <laughs> I got really lucky, but so so talking about the guys that came in. I remember uh, I traveled to Italy with the team, and I remember seeing Jimmy out there handling the ball, and he and I and he's a lefty, and he's out there handling the ball, this big kid, and I'm like, he handles he handles that rock like it's on a string. And I was like, wow, so he's uh, he can shoot the ball, he can handle the rock. His his basketball IQ is high. Um, he's a big kid, so we we went from having like one of the the, the one of one of the uh, lightest backcourts in the country to put a little beef in there, um, beef knowledge experience, um, and replacing players with players that want to come here that want to be here, and that are you, you got guys that are that are past first past first players. You got Joe Girard that brought the ball up because he was tough as nails. He had to be. It's kind of tough to be a shooter when you're also bringing the ball to the floor. Because you're throwing that first pass, it's going to be tough for you to get it back. That's but, a lot of responsibility to bring that ball up the court, man. That's it. Make decisions. That's a lot. Oh, yeah. That, that's a lot. And watch and see. Uh, I'm not a shooter, but I know if I had to dribble the ball up the floor and get the play started and then go try to find my own shots, that would kind of mess up with my equilibrium. But you put him as a shooter, that guy can shoot the rock. And you already know that he's, he's got a heart as big as the doorway because he's not he's not going to bat. He's one of those guys that if you knock him down today, put it in your calendar, you got to knock him down every single time you come up against him. And those are the kind of players that, that you want on the court. You want smart players. You got Buddy coming back. Buddy shot the ball probably as well as anybody that I've seen. Um, and it, it still makes me laugh because I was going to uh, – I remember, I remember I had been away for uh, – I went to Europe for three or four years, um, taking teams over there. And I remember coming back and I, and I see, and I see coach and Julie and these three people walking up to the, to the golf tournament together. And then I realized that there were his kids that were, they were like this big, like four years ago. And now all of them were over six feet tall. And I went, Oh boy. So you got kids that were, ball boys hanging around the gym, gym rats that talk about eat, sleep, and drink basketball with their dad all the time. So you got those guys on the floor. And see, the thing that that I, that I really like that I started noticing about Coach Beheim that he's, 
he's probably he's one of the best at taking what he's got and molding it into something and, and molding them into guys. You get a bunch of good players, but you can't make them play together. You got to help them to understand that this is what they need to do to win. And uh, I say the best thing about men is testosterone, and the worst thing about men is testosterone because their heads are hard. Their heads are so hard. You're 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 so far ahead of the game when when your players buy into what the coach is teaching, and you're way ahead of the game when your coach is 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 a, is a Hall of Fame coach. Everybody, he's one with. With, with, with talented teams, he's won with teams where he's gone to the final four with teams where people are just going like, I don't know how they got here. They're not, they have a terrible team. They're not very good. And, and he just broke it down to the, to the basics and, and had them play, had them play a two man, a two man, a two man game, which is, which is, I, is nothing that he, that he taught us. He just adjusted that team to get to where it needed to go. Now, fast forward, you fast forward, and I'll, I'll, I'll always go back and I talk about out of all the teams, out of all the teams in the country that year that Syracuse lost so many players, like they lost, like star lost guys who are going to be filling in, and then and they still went to the Final Four. I still remember hearing uh, one of the coaches complain because Zion missed two games. I'm like, you got like four McDonald's All-Americans on your team. Syracuse just lost, for all intents and purposes, just lost three out of four players that should have been starting. Yeah. And they went to four. I was like, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Coach Behan probably only coached the country they could have done, they could have pulled that scheme off right there. And he showed me something when he did that because I've known him for a long time. I've watched him coach and I've, and, and I've, and I've, adopted many of many of the ways that he does that he does things to see him do something he just uh, he uh, charles barkley said the best when i went down to the final four uh charles barkley said he you know he normally doesn't like to watch the college game because they'll get a game plan and they'll stick with that game plan the whole time even though they're getting beat by 20. he said but syracuse they'll get a game plan He'll go in there, he'll modify, he'll adjust, and they'll come out there and you're looking at a different team. He said that so that's what I what I say. I no matter what a team does in the first half, I'm always anxious to see how they're how they're gonna adjust adjust to it because Coach Behan will see it and he will adjust to it. So I, I'm just I, I'm so excited about the team because um look at the bigs. We got we got bigs coming out of the ears. You got Jesse, who is a legitimate seven footer and he's got he's got seven footers attitude you got barama that's healthy now barama i i look at barama and i can see barama could play a four if they syracuse can put a big a big big team on the floor if they want to um but it, it all depends on how coach behind sees it working and the second thing is i remember having conversations with uh with jesse last year I got to meet his parents when he went to Europe and I, and I got to spend time with him when they came back here. I remember ta talking to him all along saying like he'd have a good game and then like uh, he might not play the next game. And I remember talking to him, I said, Jesse, listen, if you're a starter, you earn your minutes by how you play in the game. And I said, when you're not starting, you earn your minutes by how you play in practice. I said, so you need to change your whole focus on if I said, so I said to him, I said, is somebody in practice really standing out and doing a lot of things? He said, and he said, yeah. And I said, well, that needs to be you. Because for you to get, Coach Beheim is not going to give you anything. But if you go out there and you earn it and during practice and you get into the game, but I said, it's up to you. I said, you got to figure out the things that you need to do. Big man got to rebound. Big man got to get up and down the floor and you got to be able to stay in the game because at the, at the big man spot, when, when everybody else makes a mistake, you're the solution. You, you solve that problem. The anchor. Yeah. When you make, when you make a mistake, your man will score in 0.2 seconds. So work, not making mistakes 
and working on being helpful and watch to see if the other things don't fall into place. So Jesse's been very good in his attitude. And I said, and, and be very careful about your attitude. You got to understand that you're out here, that you're out here working. It, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You're building, no matter what game you play, you take something positive out of that game and you never want to go back because you want to build on it, keep building on it. And um, I mean, I just, it, this team is going to be a great shooting team. It's going to have depth. You got to have a point guard that um, that wants. It's a pass first point guard. He wants to he wants to facilitate. I know Jimmy. He'll want to facilitate. Um, there's going to be guys that can shoot the ball. And you know the, the beauty of it all, is, Eric, is this: when you got as a big man, I the only thing I want to I would want to do is be able to play one on one against my man. This year, they're not going to be able to double off of whoever's playing in that post. They're not going to be able to double off off of, off of anybody to help because if they do, they're going to get. So that's going to leave that's going to leave a phenomenon that doesn't happen in, in many situations. You, when you shoot the ball so well that your big man can actually play one on one under the basket. So the mindset for the post is: if you catch your ball, if you catch a ball with your foot in the paint. The only, the only acceptable outcome is a basket or on the foul line, preferably a basket and a foul shot. Yeah. <laughs> break, them to, break them down. I mean, I, Not, I really like what they got, and I'm anxious to see how they put it, how Coach puts it together because he was so funny because when they won the national championship, Coach Beheim, his last, his last speech was uh, in Rochester. And I went up there to see him. And, and in that speech, he said, well, up, everybody, today is the last day that I'm a genius. Tomorrow I'm going to be an a-hole again because we start practice. He always does it, though. He, 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 like you said, he always he makes, like, something out of nothing. And, and, and I think this year we, have, we do have a lot of talent. Uh, we're, we're not as athletic as maybe we usually are, but – we have shooters everywhere. Now I'm just, what can we do defensively? Can we be consistent? Can we rebound the ball? Can we defend? I think we're going to make shots. You talked about the floor is going to be like, like this. Not only is it going to give our, our big guys one-on-one -on -one opportunities, but it's going to have the driving lanes be like this for our guards. And now it's just make the right decision. Pull up, kick yeah. out, whatever it is. Because I mean, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to, it, it, there's a saying, there's a saying in, in Italian, uh, defense at, at, a, at a competitive core. And it, that basically means that any team playing against a shooting team like Syracuse, it's like having, it's like having a single blanket on a California King size bed. <laughs> you only be able to cover, you'll be able to cover a little bit of it. And that's going to leave a gaping hole. There's going to be so many other opportunities. So boy, it'll boil down to, to making the right reads. Um, yeah, it, it and, I, and I, I'm looking forward. The one thing that I love to see is bigs that learn how to pass big. So it's very important. So Jimmy's in the game or, or Brown's in the game and whoever's on the high post, when, they, when you learn how to pass the high post, bigs, because bigs, bigs know how to pass the ball to bigs. And when they start doing that, whoo that's gonna that's gonna create a big headache for a whole lot of people. And we're not even talking we're not even talking about best three point shooters. Woo! Eric, I I I got I gotta get a drink. I'm getting too excited here. It's such... Okay. <laughs> no, I agree with you. It's, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fun year, man. I'm I'm looking forward to it. You know what, Rosie? We gotta we gotta have you on again, man, down the line um, during the year. Uh, appreciate you coming on, Rosie. It was awesome. You like again the whole podcast dropping gems like this, but you just got to catch them. Yeah, you know it's it, it's great, you know, and it like I said, I still now now I'm not sure how old your daughters are now, but uh, hopefully when I get to see them next time, they'll they'll uh, they'll wave at me because they they pretended like I was invisible the last time I saw. Them. Oh no, they they're will. kind they're kind of. Young. I'm gonna make sure Rosie 13 and 11. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure that uh yeah that they say hi for sure. <laughs> I'll be yeah. looking forward to it. All right. All right, Take bro. Take care, man.